Welcome to Hawthorne University's webinar series, and it's our first presentation of 2018. I think that's the first time I'm saying that out loud, too. So welcome. I'm Paula Bartholomew, and I'm just so delighted to be able to facilitate this production, because today we're so pleased to have best-selling author and nutrition and overeating expert Julia Ross with us presenting The Cravings Cure, How to Identify and Activate your natural appetite control. So hello, Julia. It's so great to have you back with us at Hawthorne. Thank you, Paula. I'm glad to be with you again, yeah. my fellow pioneer. Uh, <laughs> yes, fellow pioneers we are. Let me introduce you a little bit here and get us started. Julia, yes, is our pioneer here. She's our expert today. She's a pioneer in the use of nutritional therapy for the treatment of eating disorders and addictions and mood problems. She's the director of several integrative treatment clinics in San Francisco Bay Area since 1980, and she's trained in certified health professionals, and she lectures widely. She's the author of several best-selling books, notably The Mood Cure, The Diet Cure, and her newest release is The Cravings Cure. Her work has been featured broadly in publications from Vogue to the Journal of American Psychological Association, as well as online television and more. If you want to hear and find out more about Julia's work, check out the website at juliarosscures.com. Julia is going to share more about how we contracted this epidemic of unnatural weight gain and diabetes and diet-related conditions. There's a fabulous questionnaire that really helps us identify the unique cravings profiles. Um, and she'll be addressing the food addiction where it starts in the brain, go over some eating guidelines, and get really deep into how to use amino acid therapy to neutralize cravings. So Julia, I want to let you get started now, but I want to let everybody know that um, there'll be time for question and answers after Judy, Julia's presentation. But at any time during the presentation, don't hesitate. Just post your questions to um, the webinar panel. And I want to let everybody know this new book, the, the, um, the Cravings Cure. Julie's going to give a copy of it away uh, at the end of the webinar. So there'll be a survey to fill out. You'll be able to fill it out for an opportunity to win that. Um, I think that's it, Julie. I'm going to turn this over to you. Well, thank you, Paula. Thank you for your many years of support. Um, it's always a pleasure to work with you, and I'm glad to collaborate with Hawthorne tonight. Um, many people have asked me why I wrote a third book, uh, why I wrote The Craving Cure, and I'd like to begin this presentation by explaining why. The Diet Cure was my first book, and I threw everything into it that I knew. Uh, but at that time, I'd only been directing nutritional therapy programs for 15 years. Uh, a few years later, I decided that I didn't say enough about how the nutritional therapy that we developed at my clinics improved the bad mood epidemic that was overcoming us. Uh, and a number of years later, five years to be exact, I looked back at what had been accomplished by my books, and I saw that hundreds of thousands of people in this country and other countries had read the book, had benefited from the book, but that it was a drop in the bucket when we look at the what I call the dietary apocalypse that's overtaking us now uh, in this country and being exported abroad. And I talked to people and I looked at the books and I made a decision that the diet cure as useful and broad ranging as it is did not give enough information about the techniques of turning off cravings within 24 hours. I gave 30 pages to what uh, I regard as the only method available 
in the world at this time and probably ever for turning off, turning back the, the tide of uh, toxic commercial food uh, that's engulfing us um, now. And so I decided that I was going to write a book that would give 300 pages to this important technique. And uh, in fact, I've given 400 pages because not only have I added 15 years worth of increased experience using the amino acids to alter uh, faulty brain chemistry and specifically to turn off the, the chemical cravings that are so powerful now. But I also felt that I needed to explain uh, more about how the brain works and how things have changed since the 1970s when the problems that we're seeing now were really in their early stages. So I'm going to cover uh, all of that in more detail in this presentation, but I wanted to give you an idea why I made this decision five years ago and have been working on this book ever since. There are two audiences for this book. One of them is the lay reader. Uh, I wanted the lay reader to have every detail needed, very specific directions for how to use each amino acid and how to determine which amino acids would be appropriate for their use. But I also wanted to give professionals a manual so that they would understand exactly what to do when confronted with most of their clients. You know, most of the, the clients that uh, any holistic professional sees uh, and most of the clients that any conventional health professional sees these days are suffering fundamentally from food poisoning. And if we can't spare them, if we can't rescue them from this toxic condition and allow them to eat healing foods, then all of our efforts are stymied uh, very, very seriously. So for both lay and professional readers, um, I'm sharing 30 years of work with over 4,000 clients, most of whom have benefited hugely from these actually extremely simple um, techniques. And here is the, the, uh, the life raft um, that I hope that you will all grasp. Uh, and make good use of and, and uh, find valuable for yourselves and others. Let's start with the fundamentals uh, of this Can presentation. Yes. I'm going to interrupt just a minute. I'm so sorry, but I'm going to ask you to move your mic away from your mouth just a little bit so we've got cleaner sound. Let me know if that's enough. Okay, I will. Great. So. Let's start with the fundamentals. Um, nutritional therapy really is the hope of the world, and therefore, the majority of you nutritional therapy professionals uh, listening in to this seminar um, have my my greatest uh, respect and uh, and hope. You know, I I, really, I personally hope. Um, that you can join me in um, giving this technology to all the people who need it and spreading it. Um, train other people, do whatever is needed to um, make use of this information. But I myself am not a nutritionist, um, and I'd like to say just a little bit about that. Um, in fact, I'm a psychotherapist with a master's degree in clinical psychology, and uh, the reason that I think I, I've been able to contribute um, a lot uh, by 
joining forces with the uh, with the nutritionists out there uh, is that my specific expertise um, as a psychotherapist was in the field of addiction. And in fact, I was one of the pioneers in that field as well, um, actually developing the first uh, addiction treatment models um, in uh, the San Francisco Bay Area. And that was in the late 70s. Um, by 1980, when I became the director of the program that I had entered as an intern, um, th these were the results. Um, this is what we'd achieved with all of our hard work. Um, alcohol addiction, 50% relapse. Food addiction, we had a new uh, program treating overeating as formal addiction at that time. Uh, 70 to 90% relapse. Cocaine addiction, which was the new epidemic in the early 80s, 100% relapse in 24 hours. So if I needed a clearer um, signpost, stop signpost, uh, I couldn't have gotten anything that would have really grabbed my attention um, any more than this. And I knew that what I was doing wasn't working, that I couldn't ethically continue to do it, that there had to be another way. And sure enough, um, there was another way, um, and I took it. And this presentation is about that other way. Um, but before I go on uh, to describe that path, um, I just want to say that today, uh, because addiction treatment continues to use techniques that never worked in the first place, um, we have 90 to 100 percent relapse rates in all areas. <clears throat> Crack, meth, opiates, benzos, um, behaviors. Um, and because of our failure, uh, we have increasing death rates uh, related to drug addiction, uh, amounting to 7 million a year worldwide. Um, but that, that's nothing compared to the, the death rate associated with compulsive eating or food addiction, um, which at this point amounts to at least 38 million deaths worldwide from diet-related illness. And this is why I made my decision to write a third book specifically to try and counteract uh, this deadly epidemic. I call the book The Craving Cure because craving is a word that's relatively neutral but that everyone recognizes um, in themselves. Um, we have defined our cravings as, you know, forms of gluttony, poor, will, we, poor willpower, loss of control, um, lack of motivation. There are lots of ways we've tried to explain this to ourselves, but um, it's continued to rule our lives increasingly um, destructively because we haven't understood what it was. What is the compulsion? Uh, one of the reasons that it's been so difficult for us to grasp the nature of um, our relationship to food has been uh, because of the cleverness uh, of the food industry. Um, and these kinds of images um, that really reflect the feeling that we have when we eat the foods that we then crave uh, insatiably. Um, so not only does it seem like fun, and how could fun be destructive, let alone deadly, but uh, it's our own fault if we keep eating it. And this is a technique that's no, you know, been consciously used in the food industry for quite some time, uh, brought to our attention by the uh, great whistleblower, uh, former FDA chief David Kessler in his 
fascinating book, The End of Overeating, uh, which was published in 2010, I believe. And he quoted industry chiefs that were his friends and colleagues for so many years, um, talking about um, how great it was that they could get people to be convinced that it's their own fault if they had lost control of their eating. And what a shame it was that the very things that had allowed them to create products that would overwhelm people's ability um, to, uh, to control um, were also hazardous to their health. Um, so he published the book, um, you know, he wrote the book 10 years, it was writing the book 10 years ago, he got the information before that, and this kind of mentality is, is what uh, has made it so difficult for us to recognize and come to grips with what's happening. Um, fortunately, um, um, the figures are so staggering now um, that scientific resources all over the world are focused on understanding what the cause of these uh, disasters, uh, health disasters, um, and weight disasters are. Um, and in fact, uh, Nora Vol Volkow, who's the chief of the National Institute on Drug Abuse in the United States, is a neuroscientist herself and has conducted many of their studies um, specifically on food addiction. And she estimates that about 60% of Americans are formally addicted, so biochemically impaired, um, so that they cannot choose to step away from their use of sugars, starches, and damaged fats, all damaged, highly refined, and drug-like um, by her estimation and uh, by the estimation of many other uh, scientists uh, worldwide who've been publishing almost weekly. Uh, research comes out identifying the physiological, brain-centered nature of our dilemma. Um, uh, I think I skipped something here. Yes. Um, so I want to specify that dilemma. Um, in 2002, the obesity epidemic was announced. Um, it was almost unknown before the 1970s. Um, but 30% of us by 2002 were formally uh, identified as, as obese. Um, by 2014, 46% of us had become formally identified as obese. Um, and more devastating, um, between 1970 and 2016, the diabetes rate has risen from 1% to 50%. So that's almost incalculable um, health disaster since diabetes is often a fatal illness associated with um, increased cancers, um, heart disease, kidney disease, um, amputation. Uh, it goes on and on. I regard, and I have a, a chapter on the 1970s. I lived through them uh, as a young adult, and uh, it was quite a fascinating time. Uh, it was very exciting. Uh, the music was great. Uh, but something occurred during that decade that I believe is largely responsible for the condition we're in now nutritionally. Um, in our enthusiasm, in our uh, you know excitement about change uh, that characterized the 1970s, we made five radical uh, alterations in the diet that 
humanity had been consuming uh, for roughly two million years. Um, and we did it blithely uh, with gusto and uh, without any real examination of the consequences. So let's just take a look um, quickly at how we got here. Saturated fat was the villain and, and started this whole uh, fundamental alteration in our diet um, by cutting saturated fat by 40%. The first step was taken um, because protein, uh, high protein foods, uh, meats, poultry, cheese, and so forth, um, contain significant amounts of saturated fat. They were also targeted, but also um, this was a time when spiritual leaders from other countries were coming here and uh, were very persuasive uh, uh, in terms of their dietary recommendations, you know, th that uh, spirituality was really linked with a, a vegetarian diet or a vegan diet even. The reason that protein intake cut by one-third is in italics is because this will be the theme of the rest of this presentation, this fact, um, and the consequences of it. Um, another extremely uh, uh, fateful decision uh, was to develop and release high fructose syrups, um, and this was uh, a powerful move on, on the part of the food industry um, in furthering its goal of creating uh, a certain kind of brain effect, uh, which really wasn't uh, entirely successful. The bliss point technology wasn't entirely successful until uh, fructose was introduced as the primary sweetener in the American and now the worldwide diet. Um, uh, we also began to grow an entirely new strain of wheat, dwarf wheat, um, and uh, the, one of the long-term consequences was that the amount of gluten in our diet increased. Certainly, the the number of um, products that contain uh, refined white uh, versions of this uh, substance have uh, increased right along uh, with our fructose ingestion uh, to create um, high calorie, low nutrient brain bombs. Um, another factor that really became uh, cemented uh, during the 70s and has certainly been uh, a fact of life ever since is um, voluntary starvation. Um, for the first time in human history. Uh, so these, um, the, this is the news uh, as of the, the 1970s that has permeated uh, our, our lives and our health ever since um, and has, has made it so that we are, our average diet uh, is nutrient void. Um, it's basically a high calorie drug delivery system rather than um, a life sustaining um, reality for us. Um, so let's get to brain nutrition because um, the brain uh, is really in charge and uh, it's in charge of everything that we do. Um, but what I'm going to be focusing on right now and what I focus on in the book is how the brain controls our appetite specifically. Well, let's, let's, let's dwell on this just a little bit more. So when the, when the brain is functioning optimally, uh, as, it, as it was uh, genetically programmed to do um, up, in, up until our genetics began to um, erode, uh, and the programming began to uh, become faulty over the last 50 years. Um, we were essentially free of, of uh, compulsion 
to um, to eat toxic food, we were happy with the conventional diet, which was pretty much the same as it had been um, for hundreds of thousands uh, or millions of years, really. So the whole goal of the craving cure is to return us and return our brain specifically to um, to be able to empower us once again to choose what we eat and to step away from uh, what does not serve our survival and and uh, and and so in order to cure the epidemics of of overweight and health loss um, I want us to target we've got to target um, the brain, but it's not a complicated business. We only need to work with five nutrients uh, in order to accomplish this huge, really, revolution. Um, and they're all useful because they target a specific part of the brain's appetite chemistry. It's a five-part uh, powerhouse um, that the brain has going, uh, but just a very few individual amino acid concentrates can normalize all of it. So let's get a little closer into it, what we're looking at um, in the brain. Um, in this five-part appetite control process is composed of four uh, neurotransmitters. These are gigantically powerful uh, chemicals, uh, and many of us are familiar with at least uh, two of them, serotonin, our natural antidepressant, and endorphin, our natural painkiller and pleasure enhancer uh, extraordinaire. Um, we're hearing a lot because of the brain science of food addiction now about dopamine, which is not only stimulating uh, and strengthening, activating, but but also provides us with a certain kind of powerful sense of reward. And finally, the neurotransmitter GABA, which uh, gamma aminobutyric acid is our natural tranquilizer, and when all of these lovely natural powers are at play, we're very satisfied. And food is capable of stimulating all of them. And when I say food, I mean healthy food. We have always enjoyed our dinners, our lunches, and our breakfasts uh, because our brain allowed us to enjoy them and uh, in all these four different ways. The the simplicity of our task here as uh, craving cures is uh, that each of these powerhouse um, brain uh, appetite regulators is composed of as few as one amino acid. So again, it's a formidable task, but the solution is, is really very simple. So for, for those of you who aren't clear on what amino acids are, um, they are, uh, there are 20 of them. Uh, they each have a spectacularly long name and very specific functions in the body. Um, they interact in thousands of ways um, to make all of our tissues from bone to muscle to the tiny neurotransmitters that that regulate our moods and our sensations. So one of the things we have to understand is that uh, that bliss point technology that I talked about a little earlier is designed um, by you know food scientists to overstimulate, to target and overstimulate these particular brain neurotransmitters. And they are the same neurotransmitters that alcohol and drugs impact. And so the cravings that alcohol and drug addicts have, once they're 
brain neurotransmitters have been tampered with in this in this way um, are very similar to the kinds of cravings that that uh, that we have for you know chocolate chips pasta ice cream whatever um, so in the course of this sort of explosive um, activity in the brain um, as a result of the invasion of these drug-like uh, substances, what we notice, since we, we're not aware of the exact brain chemistry as it goes along, is that we, we're developing these overwhelming cravings. We can't control what we eat in spite of knowledge and uh, motivation, in spite of um, you know, the threat of death. Uh, we have many clients who come to us who've been diagnosed with diet-related cancers, uh, let alone diabetes, and uh, still, uh, it's it, that that motivation to save their own lives is not strong enough because it turns out that the cravings for food are even stronger than the cravings for alcohol and drugs, um, and. The negative moods that uh, that result uh, further uh, our our need for for the kinds of drug sensations that we get um, that are so similar to alcohol and drug sensations. In addition to the kind of deficiency that results just from the assault uh, of these foods. Um, so that the neurotransmitters aren't producing a natural sense of satisfaction, of positive mood and energy. Um, the fact that we're more highly stressed, partly because of our general malnutrition, um, our dependence on caffeine, um, which you know uh, stimulates um, adrenaline, uh, and uh, the the high cortisol uh, levels that are the result of our sort of increasing numbers of stressors, whether you know personal, financial, health, um, or nutritional. And then we have that fundamental uh, decision that we made in the 70s to reduce the amount of protein, that unconscious decision in, in, for many people. Um, and of course, who wants protein? when you have uh, a drug like ho-ho in front of you. Um, so um, we just don't have the, the nutritional fortitude. Um, we don't have the supplies, the amino acid supplies from the, the protein in our diet to sustain the brain, let alone to help repair it from the trauma uh, of, of, of the frequent uh, junk food assaults. Um, so before we go to, to the cure aspect of this presentation, um, I'd like to just mention uh, that there is a uh, one more, a fifth uh, aspect um, to our craving, uh, the brain uh, genesis of our craving, and that is that. Um, it's very difficult for the brain to sustain stable uh, blood sugar uh, because it can't store, uh, as the muscles can do, uh, glucose um, and get you know ready access to it. So it's very common for us uh, when since we're not eating regular meals anymore, since we're eating high sugar, high high refined starch foods that uh, crescendo our glucose levels. Which then crash because of the uh, the insulin release that follows it. Um, that, that we are in a chronic state of hypoglycemia, and uh, that alone causes overwhelming cravings for carbohydrates. Anything that can be converted quickly into the glucose uh, in the bloodstream and arrive quickly to the brain. So it's the fifth target of our craving cure.
Now, I did not invent amino acid therapy. Uh, it really was the, it was the very commonsensical uh, conclusion um, and exploration of uh, some of the, too few, but some of the neuroscientists who had come on the scene in the 1970s and um, had been studying the brain and, and learning about the neurotransmitters. Um, one of them in particular, uh, Kenneth Blum, but in addition, uh, scientists from MIT and others worldwide were focusing on the brain uh, dynamic uh, underlying addiction to alcohol and cocaine initially, and then uh, and then later uh, the impact of food on the brain. Um, so what he did was to understand, to learn to understand the neurotransmitters very early on, Dr. Blum. Uh, and then he brought to bear uh, a very simple fact that everyone, um, even college level physiology students uh, is aware of, and that is that uh, the neurotransmitters are composed of very simical chemical uh, uh, contents. Uh, they're made out of specific amino acids. And he began to provide uh, studies uh, with cocaine, alcohol, and then food addicts showing that providing these uh, basic constituents of the neurotransmitters, these, uh, these constituent nutrients of the neurotransmitters, could, in concentrated form, uh, make a, a dramatic difference in terms of cravings and mood. Um, and because I was embroiled in uh, this question of how else can we address addiction, I was the director of a program that had 100% relapse rates, um, I was fascinated by all of the new information explaining that our cravings were generated in the brain. Um, and then that one of these experts was actually pointing the direction that seemed so safe and simple. Um, I was already employing nutritionists, um, and we were telling people to eat better, but they couldn't because of their brain chemistry aberrations causing such powerful food cravings, um, especially when they tried to stay away from alcohol and drugs. Um, but my nutritionists also seeing the frustration um, were eager to uh, explore this new avenue with me and we began to do pilot projects with a few clients um, using the amino acid concentrates and some information that allowed us to know which amino acids in supplement form would be the most likely to impact someone whose serotonin levels were low, whose endorphin levels were low, whose dopamine levels were low, whose GABA levels were, the, were low, or who might also uh, have hypoglycemia. Um, so that was the beginning for us, and that was in uh, 1986. Um, Subsequently, uh, Dr. Blum, with with others, uh, conduct has conducted um, some studies, um, particularly important um, are these, um, well, this one that I, I would like to talk to you about now, um, 1997 um, was published and uh, had it actually been uh, the, the study itself had been conducted several years prior, um, taking 250 uh, optifasters who'd completed their 500 calorie a day regimen, lost a significant amount of weight, um, and uh, were studied two years later. Um, this was a study that uh, provided them 
with, or at least half of them, were provided with um, a relatively small amount of tryptophan combined with an amino acid blend called uh, DL-phenylalanine. Um, this this uh, image is uh, unfortunately left off two critical words. Um, in addition to those two uh, amino uh, supplements, uh, this study provided the amino acid uh, glutamine. Uh, so this was a formula. And uh, in spite of the fact that as a formula, it couldn't contain that many of each of the amino acids, um, by combining them, it was able to target uh, four out of the five um, appetite-regulating neurotransmitters um, with fuels that could increase their function. Um, and their hope was uh, that it would increase it very quickly. Well, they found that indeed it did. And the, uh, uh, the conclusions um, were remarkable, and they were compared to the conclusions of uh, of the um, other optifasters, uh, the controls, um, who did not get the amino acids but got um, uh, a, a very low potency of vitamin mineral. Um, they, the controls, had no loss of craving, so they continued uh, at 100% craving. Um, there was a 70% loss of craving among those who were taking this blend of amino acids. Um, among the controls, 40% regained the weight versus 15% of the amino acid takers. And it's important to know that none of these people, after leaving the Optifast program, were given any nutritional advice. Um, so fast forward to a study of glutamine uh, given at the doses that we we typically use now, which is 1,500 is an average dose three times a day, um, done in Italy quite recently um, to much fanfare. Um, they also gave no nutritional advice. In fact, they said, don't make any efforts to diet while you're in this study. Just go about your business, do whatever you feel like doing. and. Uh, what they found was that they dropped 25% of their calorie intake with no effort whatsoever, um, which was about 500 calories a day. Um, and uh, they were very pleased with not only um, some weight, especially at the weight that waste that was lost, but also that all of these people who were pre-diabetic um, uh, had insulin uh, dro drops of 20%. So. Um, I'm just giving you some examples of, you know, how substantial this uh, amino acid therapy is. And then in terms of our experience with it since 1988, um, with the 4,000 clients or more that, that uh, we've worked with, um, we will often see now, as you'll, as you'll find out, um, actually witness uh, the elimination of cravings and negative moods in as little as five minutes using these um, five uh, brain-targeted amino acids. Um, so about the time that I published The Diet Cure, uh, we were seeing, and there were a couple of studies um, confirming about 83% of the overeaters in our, in our programs uh, were experiencing complete relief of their cravings, which was extraordinarily high. But since 1990, um, it's risen to over 90%. Um, and again, many of these people experiencing within 24 hours. Um, so why the improvement? You know, what what is in the uh, the heart of the craving cure? Um, the two chapters on amino acid therapy that take each amino acid um, uh, very specifically in terms of um, how to choose it, um, how to trial it, um, how to how to monitor dosing and adjust dosing as needed, and how to terminate uh, the use of the amino. Um, for example, um, 
we know now that if anybody has an adverse reaction to an amino, we can antidote it in, in minutes um, with 1,000 to 2,000 milligrams of vitamin C powder uh, dissolved in water. And there's, a tr trialing has been a tremendous innovation uh, and is loads of fun and is uh, tremendously helpful in creating confidence in the client because they see right away, this is worth doing. My compliance on these aminos is going to be 100%. Um, we've also learned to use the, um, the uh, neurotransmitter and blood sugar level assessment tool um, throughout, frequently th throughout our contact with clients so that we know exactly which aminos are doing what. And, uh, what else needs to be what else needs to be done? Is it time yet to drop the amino? Do we need to double it? That sort of thing. Um, that we know now that for each of the uh, five brain uh, brain chemicals that needs to be enhanced uh, to to normalize appetite, we have two choices in almost every case now, not just one. And we know exactly not exactly because there's always individual variation in response, but we know much more about um, not only which one to choose, but, but about what kind of dosing to consider, especially with children um, and with sensitive adults. Um, we're also clear on the contraindications. There are some people who shouldn't take all of these amino acids, even if their symptoms indicate that they need it and there are reasons for it that are made very clear in the book. Um, uh, so, the most important part of this whole process and the most important part of the book really is uh, placed at the beginning of the book, and it's also online, it's the five-part craving type questionnaire. So, it identifies which of the five brain functions is deficient. Um, there's a 1 to 10 severity score in addition to a checkoff uh, for each of the symptoms. and we have developed this tool um, since we started trialing because we have done probably 20,000 trials where we gave an amino acid and saw exactly which symptoms were eliminated, which deficiency symptoms were eliminated by that uh, amino acid. Um, so this is a tremendous you know, move forward. Um, and what we find is that we need to do these amino acid therapy we use a mini, uh, a mini version to expedite uh, the evaluations over time, but we need to do it regularly for three to 12 months. Some people need aminos more than 12 months, but it's unusual, and they're mostly people who have a family addiction, a genetic difficulty with, um, with addiction, um, a family history of addiction, uh, therefore a genetic problem that takes longer. It's responsive, but it just takes longer. Um, so here we go. These are the, these are the uh, craving types. Um, the uh, the most common is the the craving t the craver uh, who is low in our sunny antidepressant serotonin, um, and the amino solution, the cure, is uh, either tryptophan or 5-HTP. Uh, and there are uh, there's guidance in the book about which one to try first, given uh, the nature of the specific person you're working with. Uh, type 2, uh, the second most common, uh, is the hypoglycemic craver um, who, who, whose blood sugar crashes and, and uh, tremendous cravings result. And here only one is needed, only one uh, amino acid is needed, and that's the, the marvelous, even miraculous uh, glutamine. Uh, you'll read about its extraordinary um, impact on diabetes. Um, uh, and, and eliminating craving is only one of its uh, the mechanisms by which it's so helpful, life-saving, really. Um, oops, I skipped one. Uh, the third uh, craving type is the is a craver of comfort um, who is low in the endorphins that would otherwise be killing pain, allowing them to enjoy, you know, uh, an apple. Um, and uh, in this case, uh, D-phenylalanine or DL-phenylalanine, there's a typo here, um, 
is what's needed. Um, I, I repeated this image because chocolate is such an extraordinary endorphin booster. It's uh, drug-like uh, pleasurableness is, uh, is quite phenomenal, but it disappears uh, under the impact of D-phenylalanine or D-L-phenylalanine, I promise you. Um, the fourth craving type is the stressed craver. Not all stressed people eat over their stress or get any relief from food. Um, but there's a goodly number, uh, at least 30% um, um, of overeaters are eating because of stress. And so they're deficient in their natural tranquilizer, GABA, the, the neurotransmitter that needs to be built up. Um, in this case, we can use GABA, which is also an amino acid, um, uh, directly, or if that's not successful, we've found that the amino acid theanine um, will fill the bill. And finally, uh, the fifth craving type is, um, is the fatigue craver, uh, who is low in stimulating uh, dopamine as well as norepinephrine and also adrenaline. So um, these, these cravers are looking for something with caffeine in it, with chocolate in it, which is uh, also, chocolate is also stimulating. Um, and these people are uh, really benefited very, very quickly by either tyrosine or phenylalanine, one of these two amino acids uh, has an almost instant um, pick-me-up effect that's visible during the trialing in minutes uh, after they take an amino acid. Uh, the directions for working with uh, children as well as adults is identified um, in the book. Uh, and as I said earlier, the steps for deciding, assessing, uh, choosing an amino acid, trialing it, dosing it initially, and then adjusting it using the amino acid therapy chart uh, redos, and then terminating it uh, at whatever is an appropriate time. Our experience is the younger the person, uh, the sooner they are able to terminate the amino acids. Uh, but it's all dependent, uh, the termination process is all dependent on the dietary improvement. So in other words, the amino acids alone are not going to create the bulwark against craving uh, without the increase in uh, nutritious food, protein in particular. But because the amino acids are so effective at eliminating the cravings, the, the ability to change the diet uh, is extraordinary. And typically within 24 to 48 hours, people are completely different, having a completely different experience at the market. Uh, and you don't have to worry about compliance because they are under control. They have their willpower back. They have their brain power back. In terms of what an anti-craving diet should be, as you all know, the Conflict is never ending. Um, should it be paleo? Should it be ketogenic? Should it be vegan, vegetarian? Should it be locale? Uh, if so, what kind of fasting? Um, a lot of locale is, is going under the, the guise of cleansing now, but it's all starvation, which uh, we learned from the study last year on the biggest losers. Um, that low-calorie dieting is uh, really the worst thing you can do uh, for long-term uh, weight loss and for craving loss in particular. Uh, I just hope that uh, this information gets out there because as you could see from the post-Optifast dieters, even on a 500-calorie diet, which is less than the uh, poor uh, um, biggest losers, were, were, although it's unclear how many calories the biggest losers were eating, they, they really were going down very, very low without uh, formally, um, you know, admitting it, really. Uh, they were doing whatever they needed to do to win. But um, 
the, the question is there, you know, okay, we won't go locale. What does that mean? How high can we go and still lose weight? Well, that's an individual matter, but we've found uh, that it's almost always a problem under 2,000 calories for, for females and higher for males. So as a non-nutritionist, I don't have to be embroiled in the same way that uh, those of you who are nutritionists do in um, looking at these various diets and their competing claims. Um, I'm looking at it now from a historical record. We have been eating omnivorously um, for two million years that we know of now, uh, or more. Um, and until the 1970s, on a diet that combined animal source foods with plant source foods, we maintained an extraordinary level of health, weight, mood, sleep, and other essential human functions until after the 1970s. So I am recommending that we use that guide to determine what an individual's uh, successful diet should be. Um, and I've identified two kinds of traditional diets based on the historical record. And one of them is the hunter-gatherers, which is more the paleo, uh, which is um, the diet that really was um, roots and berries and uh, animals and other plants. Um, but it predated the herder planters who came on about 12, thousand years ago and uh, began to grow food so that the plant-based uh, portion of our diet uh, was more reliable. It wasn't as uh, dependent on, on uh, the weather and, and uh, subject to famine and so forth. So the animal protein continued, but the plant uh, component uh, in, started to include things like dried beans, which had never been available before, and and uh, grains, um, as well as dairy products. So until the 70s, um, we were eating a herder planter diet, and um, our our weight and our health did not appear to be so impaired. Um, we did start to develop some heart disease. But uh, that appears to be because our sugar consumption began to increase and we added the trans fats. Uh, both of those things started in the 30s. Um, so since no other diets have a tr real track record of proven benefit, um, I recommend that we use this historical view uh, as our as our basis for creating diets that are individualized that uh, really take into account the kind of person uh, the the genetic background of that person the dietary traditions um, that that person derived from uh, and finally I'd like to just say a few words about the uh, the great proponent of traditional diets, uh, and it's a cautionary tale. Um, I do have a blog on it uh, on my website that I recommend to you as well. Um, Dan Buettner uh, wrote these lovely books um, based on his travels in various parts of the world and identifying the the cultures and and the diets associated with those cultures that produced uh, the oldest, healthiest people. His, his, his conclusions have been very influential and, and really um, quite lovely until uh, he wrote a book more recently about how we could apply his conclusions and the, cult and the, the diets and lifestyles of the cultures that he'd identified to our own life. And at this point, he did something that 
uh, is is a tremendous and I regard as dangerous temptation to us, and that is to defer to uh, experts who are uh, advocating a whole new kind of eating style. Um, and this is particularly ironic given uh, the Blue Zone's commitment to traditional eating and, and lifestyle. Um, but uh, Dan Buettner has, has uh, made a decision uh, to bring on experts who are advocating a, a, a vegan, a pesca vegan, uh, daily fish use, uh, and otherwise uh, essentially no protein, uh, very little fat, little or no fat. Um, and I, I think that he's he's someone who uh, we need to look at uh, in in choosing our own and in advocating for our clients uh, the kind of dilemma that modern nutrition is facing. So now you have uh, an idea of the amino acid cure. You you also have an idea of the recommendations that I'm making for the dietary cure. Uh, that must go along with it. And now, uh, I think that we're close to ready for our for our questions and answers. All right, thank you, Julia. We are indeed ready for that. So let me. Um... Okay, we ended on fats. Let's go back to fats. We started. With fats, addicted to fats, the um, also recommend traditional fat, such as butter, lard, coconut oil, etc. So clearly, not all fats are created equal. Is the notion of being addicted to fats related to vegetable oils in processed junk? I don't think so. Um, uh, not that I know of. It, it it turns out that all fats are scrumptious um, and. Uh, they stimulate uh, endorphin activity, but not astronomical endorphin activity, just enough to give us that satisfaction. Uh, it is true that saturated fats um, do tend to be more satisfying than vegetable oils, but uh, really the, the brain doesn't seem to be able to distinguish them, and that's one of the reasons that it's so important for us to know, you know, intellectually what the difference between uh, an ancient saturated fat and a modern uh, highly inflammatory high omega-6 vegetable oil as in corn, canola, soy um, is and, and what it does to us. It's terribly important that, in, that this cure include the uh, substitution of the traditional saturated fats and unsaturated, you know, um, olive oil is certainly fine, avocado oil, uh, but that we eliminate as much as possible um, our use of these new and refined and in many cases damaged vegetable oils. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Let's talk a little bit about dieting. Did you say that um, women didn't diet before the 70s? Uh, no, I said that it, it wasn't a, a a, a, a household word, everyone, uh, men, women, and children were not dieting uh, before the 70s. Um, dieting actually became a, a, a kind of a, uh, oh, a recreational activity because of Twiggy. Um, we decided, well, that would be fun. Let's see if we can look like Twiggy. Um, it wasn't because we had... Uh, a serious weight problem going that we gravitated towards tw Twiggy, but because we couldn't, uh, you know, we, we, we really couldn't sustain uh, a starvation diet, um, we began to have the rebound effects of those diets more and more. And by the 70s, mm -hmm. um, we were developing uh, weight problems, not only from the recreational dieting that we'd done in, mostly in the 60s, but also from the brand new foods and particularly the introduction of the uh, high fructose syrups, which includes agave syrup and fruit syrup. 
and I make a, a, a very clear uh, explanation of that that I think is terribly important for us all to understand. Okay. So is it the is it the actual word diet that you're emphasizing here? Because clearly women restricted their calorie intake before the 70s for whatever reasons. Uh, they did, and it was a destructive activity. In fact, all of the studies on eating disorders at the time, and remember I was in the field at the time, right. um, identified low-calorie dieting as the um, originator, you know, the, the real trigger of eating disorders behavior. Mm -hmm. so do you think that it came more out of um, the, uh, the field of dietetics, that a calorie is a calorie, and cut a calorie and you lose a pound? Oh, certainly it did. You know, first it was recreational, and then uh, the the dietitians uh, and the closely associated, you know, PhD nutrition nutritionists mm -hmm. like Ansel Keys got on board. Okay, it, it's a good distinction here because I, you know, when I look at my historical perspective, I really see. Um, agricultural shift in the 50s of being a significant marker of people moving off the farms into the cities, smaller farms becoming smaller and smaller and less of it, um, more processed foods being brought in, and a big rise in um, associated unhealthy weight. I mean, I saw my, my family of farmers, they were hardy, full-bodied people, but I wouldn't say fat until the 50s. And then came the illnesses of diabetes, et cetera. No, di diabetes did, did not come that early. Uh, in the 60s, it was only 1%. It really, uh, the diabetes explosion has occurred since the 1970s. You may have had a family that was vulnerable to it and were more aware of it, uh, but uh, that that's one of the extraordinary things about this last 50 years. The most extraordinary thing about it is that we've gone from 1% to 50% in terms of our diabetes percentage. Okay, then I want you to expand a little bit more on your what you were terming voluntary starvation. As, is it, are you distinguishing that from reducing calories? No, I'm not. I'm okay. just, basically I'm saying that if, if we reduce calories, um, we are embarking on, on a, an experiment in starvation. There's just no other way we can look at it. And there are <laughs> negative, sorry, there are negative <laughs> repercussions. And, and hasn't it gotten even more severe with conditions of bulimia and anorexia, that level of starvation? Well, Certainly our rates of bulimia and anorexia have increased as we've continued to diet, but as weight has gone completely out of control and people have seen that diets don't work, they're, they're actually modifying uh, dieting. So it's very popular now to do periodic cleanses just for a month. People aren't really trying to stay on a low calorie diet forever and ever anymore. It's just impossible. Mm -hmm. So the whole world of dieting is in a tr tremendous flux. Mm -hmm. um, but still pretty, it's got a strong grasp about it. What do you, what's your um, impression with intermittent fasting? Well, I'm not sure. It's again uh, a form of starvation. People are typically eating two instead of three meals. What I've seen in the individual cases that I've, um, you know, been involved in is that people who eat very large, two very large meals that are high in saturated fat and protein with lots of low calorie vegetables often do pretty well on it. But we've seen many people completely unable to do it with um, blood sugar reactions that make it really impossible, feeling weak and, um, and tired and uh, really unable to go on with it. When you spoke about, there's a question about um, diet-related illnesses and determination of death by diet-related illnesses. Do you know how this is determined? Is it based on category like obesity or 
or um, diabetes? How do they it's, determine that something's diet related? Well, uh, diabetes is is the um, is the key really uh, because, for example, the incidence of certain kinds of cancer are higher among diabetes and uh, among diabetics. Um, so, um, the, one of the ways they look at it is is in in looking at you know what gives rise to diabetes. Um, they're very convincing, large population studies showing that the the amount of sugar consumed is really the definitive issue. And mm -hmm. so um, we know that, you know, the amount of sugar is the diet related factor uh, with diabetes. And uh, we do know that high fructose sugars are much more destructive and much more diabetes producing and exacerbating than sucrose, mm -hmm. yeah. which helps explain why the rate of diabetes was so much lower in the past. Yeah. All right. Excellent point. Mm. With um, amino acid, let's go into amino acids and working with them. Can they be tested via lab work? Yes, they can. And, and I've got a section uh, in the um, uh, testing tools um, portion at the end of the book um, for people to look at the resources there. I don't know why it's not done more often uh, because we can test for amino acid levels um, in, uh, in plasma. We can test for neurotransmitter levels in plasma. That's very easy. You can do that at almost any lab, big lab. Um, but we can also uh, test at least for two of the most common neurotransmitters uh, that are at stake here, serotonin and uh, uh, dopamine, we can test for their levels very, very accurately um, using blood platelet testing. Um, and I, I give a source, uh, an easy and fairly reasonably, reasonably priced source in the book. Um, all of these kinds of testing um, are compared against what's considered the gold standard, which is uh, uh, cerebrospinal testing, uh, which was what you know people were paid to uh, undergo this procedure, so that we could actually get into the nervous system and test you know how many of these neurotransmitters were actually available to us, um, and the 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 one form of testing that shows the least correspondence to this gold standard is urine testing. So that is a form of amino acid testing that I would strongly recommend that people not take terribly seriously. We have seen hundreds of test results that do not conform to symptoms and do not conform to the blood testing. And, and would you that think could, sorry, the, the blood testing, would it be, it seems so variable, an amino acid in the body versus protein. I mean, it's breaking down, you know, if, if, if a blood test was taken within an hour of eating versus five hours of eating a protein, don't you think the results would be quite varied? Well, it, it, th there are uh, reference ranges um, attached to the amount of time after a meal the, the blood testing is done. So that, mm -hmm. that helps a lot. Um, and, and as we have found, you know, some of these deficiencies are so deep that they just do show up. We don't, sure. we don't actually do very much uh, blood testing because we have found that the, the research using the, the uh, cerebrospinal fluid and the blood platelet testing that was done in the 80s um, really revealed what symptoms of deficiency were. Mm -hmm. And that's their great value to us is that early research. So now we know what, what, how does someone who's serotonin deficient, how do they feel? And when we give a serotonin deficient person, for example, who is depressed, feeling negative and pessimistic and irritable, having trouble sleeping, uh, when you give someone like that um, the, uh, a supplement of tryptophan, uh, or 5-hydroxytryptophan, 
we see those specific uh, symptoms go away. Now, they may still be tired, but fatigue isn't a symptom of serotonin deficiency. So we, we've been able to verify the accuracy of that early research using the blood testing for, to identify deficiencies. We've been able to verify it with you know, these 20,000 trials we've done, giving people who seem to have a serotonin deficiency or an endorphin deficiency, um, the specific nutrient associated with it that will correct that situation and uh, verified will indeed those symptoms that were uh, originally identified uh, are were very accurate. So now we can use the symptom questionnaire instead of having to go and duplicate the blood testing. But it's nice right. to have fairly reliable uh, blood testing available to us if we need it. For example, yeah. if we have a pregnant woman, and uh, as we as we have had uh, with very severe symptoms, does not want to pass on uh, the symptoms to the infant would like to use the amino acid precursors, but there's some c concern. Um, we will verify that there really is a deficiency mm -hmm. and then work with the OBGYN uh, um, to, uh, to provide her with safe, uh, safe levels. Oftentimes with pregnant women, however, we will give them a multi-amino that includes tryptophan because that is very much like the multivitamin mineral that, that, that OBs like pregnant women to take. It's basically a multi-amino, and uh, they love it, and, uh, and it works pretty well. It's not as complete um, a solution, but it's very good. All right, thank you. Though there was a follow-up question of a questionnaire versus lab work, and, and you just handled that really well. Oh, thank because you. Because you have um, you have fantastic questionnaires that have been used from from mood cure, mood cure, and now in cravings cure. So that's where I rely, and it's um, it's affordable for people also, and I find very accurate. Well, that's a good point. You know, because many people talk about you know well the expense but really there's very little expense you know if if the craving cure becomes an international bestseller we we will have to worry about our amino acid supplies but as it stands we have plenty of amino acids at very reasonably priced available you know in every health venue online even in supermarkets and and uh, and drug stores that's right may it stay that way Amen. <laughs> um, no, I'm not just have a feeling, Julia. When when you first started seeing results using amino acids in your clinic, just in your early years, just how giddy you must have been. Um, you know, I mean, speaking of being a pioneer, I mean, you are championing this to a large degree through the work that you're doing and the books that you're writing and the workshops that you offer and the trainings and so it's just it's really amazing to me to be able to see something this entrenched and chronic turned around so simply well I, I'm glad that you mentioned the joy of it because it's one of the things that I, I definitely want us to get across to the clinicians who are uh, on board here tonight is this is fun mm -hmm. uh, and when you have somebody come in who's you know, impatient, irritable, uh, demoralized, you know, a typical person who comes in, gets some recommendations for diet and never comes back. Um, but you can right then and there give them a very quick assessment, um, take a look at contraindications in minutes, possible contraindications, and then actually give them samples uh, of these uh, amino acid supplements. and watch with them. They're aware of it. Uh, sometimes they'll even point to a part of their brain and say, I can feel something changing over here. Um, and, uh, and you know, when you end up laughing with somebody who's crying with you to, mm -hmm. to begin with, you know, in their despair, um, it's, it, it definitely keeps you going. It's definitely kept me going. Yeah, I bet. <laughs> we need things to keep us going. And, you know, just the thought of of having lost so much of the pleasure of 
eating. I mean, it's so sad to lose that. And so I think that's one of the most valuable parts of this work is that people can experience the pleasure of eating again when they make some common changes. All right, I, um, I need to close us here. So, I, and I just want to thank you for, Julia, for bringing this um, latest research and the clinical findings to us and, and really for persevering and, and pioneering this work. I just I want to thank you for all you do and for this presentation too. Well, thank you and helping me to take it a step further, Paula. You bet. I've got a few closing comments, everybody, so if you just bear with me. I want to remind you that the webinar is recorded. It's going to be available on the Hawthorne's website under archived webinars in just a few days. So it'll be up there with a plethora of other topics that you can browse through as well. I'll also remind you about the survey that you can fill out right in a couple of minutes. It helps us to have your feedback and comments. We always consider it carefully. So I appreciate you taking the time, but today it's even more of, uh, important to you. If you want a copy of the MOOC here, here's your chance to win a copy. You fill out that survey. You can no, the copy. craving cure. They can't have the ah. mood cure. <laughs> <laughs> it's getting late. I'm getting hot. Hypoglycemic in my brain. Thank you, Julia. <laughs> craving cure will come to you if you're, if, you're the, if you're the one we select. Also, a reminder that tomorrow is um, our next All About Alumni. We have Julia Visser on at noon Pacific time presenting on her post-graduation activities. This is a fabulous profile that we do here to showcase our graduates. I hope you show up for that. And if we've inspired you to learn more about health and nutrition, please check out our website. We have some fabulous courses. And Kathy McDermott's our director of admissions. She will help you. And so I want to thank everybody for sticking with us. Thank you, Julia, again. It's been a fabulous educational experience. I wish you all the best of health and look forward to learning more together at Hawthorne's webinars and our All About Alumni series. Thanks again, everybody. Good night. <laughs>